Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to have you on. I am looking forward to diving into a whole host of topics with you today, including everything from how you met your co-founder, what you've been doing recently, you've been expanding the company for hiring. Um, but before we get into all of that wonderful stuff, um, just give me a quick 30 second pitch of what you guys actually do at Escape. Sure. So at Escape Technologies, we're essentially building a real time 3D map of the world that we use to precisely locate camera devices down to sub centimeter precision. And the reason why that's important is because over the next five, 10 years, we're moving from computers that sit behind these little rectangles in the world, whether that's the rectangle in your pocket or the rectangle that sits on your desk to these computing devices that have a physical position in the world. And the key thing to all of these is they need to understand their position with far more accuracy and acuteness than our desktop computer, for example. And tell me, how will the world look different when hopefully your thesis plays out as you hope it does? So what, how, what will it look like? Paint me a picture. Sure. So these computing devices, which I talk about moving from rectangles, include, think about your self-driving car. You know, this is a computer on wheels with an engine. Um, think about drones. Uh, that are going to have a more common place in the world around us. These are going to have to be able to navigate the, the surroundings with more accuracy than they can currently do. Um, think about augmented reality, which is our primary focus here at Scape. Um, they need to have essentially this, this kind of one-to-one -one map of the world that we can use to be able to augment uh, the world with the same ease as we can do with um, uh, you know, digital spreadsheet, for example. Mm -hmm. And with robotics, we've all seen the incredible things that has been done with um, Boston Dynamics over the past few days. Um, essentially, what we're building is there's a parallel towards the internet where you have a laptop that's a fairly dumb piece of um, a computing device. Um, but when you add the capability of the internet, suddenly you have at your fingertips um, an infinite num uh, number of, of, of facts and information about the world. And essentially what we're doing is comparable for that for these machines. So they start to have an understanding of what the world looks like and how it's structured that they can tap into at any one, one time. What was your path into this space? So it's not something that somebody usually just falls into. How did it come about? Was this something you've been thinking about? at university and how did you end up building the company that you built? Sure, so it's, it's been a bit of a winding road, I'll admit. Um, so I actually wanted to become a creative director in advertising um, and phoned up uh, probably about 10 different uh, creative directors at the various uh, well-known ad agencies when I was at school, you know, Mother London, BMB, um, companies like that saying, in 10 years, if I wanted to be in your position, what do I do now? And they said, forget about doing advertising. Pick something that's of interest to you, that broadens your horizons, that you can then use to kind of segue into advertising in the future, if that's indeed what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So studied philosophy of psychology, picked up a love for photography, and I was aware at the time of seeing um, what I kind of refer to as interactive imagery these kind of very early stages, early examples of 360-degree imagery and, and um, these gigapixel, massively large-scale uh, images that you can zoom in and out of, and started to take that, experiment with it. Um, I was sticking cameras together to, to create 360-degree you know, video cameras um, ages ago, and, and um, that basically gave me uh, my first taste of, of what this kind of new future, future could be like. And we've seen how that's kind of panned out a little bit now. Um, I actually was one of the first street view photographers in the UK. So while I was experimenting, I saw what Google was doing over in the States mm -hmm. and thought, hmm, if that's, that's anything like what Google is like, sooner enough that's going to be in over here in the UK. So I gave them a message saying, look, I'm experimenting with this stuff. How about um, I you know, help work on some of this UK rollout? So that gave me a pretty intimate insight into the way that Google can scale something like this. And also my first insight into how this technology can be used for maps, not just for um, its creative merit, but for an actual uh, utilitarian um, use case. And from that point onwards, managed to ride the wave into VR and AR. And from that position, it gives you a pretty unique um, overview of the elements of the puzzle which need to be filled in in the future. Um, and I believe what we're doing at Scape Technologies is one of those fundamental um, puzzle pieces, which is going to be needed not just for augmented reality, but for paving the way for all these future devices. 
Mm, I want to come back to the thread of like taking this to market and possible applications as well. But before we go into that, tell me about the experience of finding your co-founder and like how did EF fit into that process? Had you also looked for co-founders before? Like, just tell me about that whole experience and what you were looking for. Sure. So I, I've, I've had very various different um, uh, businesses in the in the past, um, and I think what I realized when I was trying to figure out what these puzzle pieces look like is in order to, to fill in those puzzle pieces, I needed someone with a very specific set of talents. You know, I, I could code, uh, but by no means was I proficient. And certainly I didn't have the skills needed to do this very niche area that I needed, which was essentially computer vision. So it is a struggling point of where do you find someone, not only with the skill sets that you need, but also at the same point in life where they're able to dive into, um, you know, such an adventure like starting your own company. So I'd heard about EF. Um, I went for, a, for one of these interviews and, and got through. And I guess my path was a little unique in as far as most people come to the EF program and, and do a series of, um, you know, quick fire dating each other and, and then, you know, finding a co-founder, maybe splitting up, finding another co-founder, splitting up, finding another co-founder, and then building this company together. But actually, truth be told, um, we met each other at the pub you know, mm-hmm. before the the the, um, the program had even started, um, and realized in an instant that we both had the opposite set of necessary skills that the other person was looking for. So rather than waiting until the um, the program started, we dived straight in and, and was working on this um, the, for the summer before actually joining into EF. Then once we did, we just kind of continued running from that point onwards to, to where we are today. And how important was it for you to click with your co-founder on a personal level? Was that something you were very conscious of that you, you wanted to get each other, basically, to put it bluntly? Of course. Um, you don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to, 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 to feel like you have to hang out all the time. I mean, obviously, you're going to be spending a huge amount of time with this person. And maybe, actually, because you spend all your entire uh, working life with them, it's good to have a little bit of time of time away at some points. Uh, but having the ability to communicate those ideas and sharing the same ethos um, being able to communicate without having to, you know, uh, having it be a pain. It should just be this fluent extension of yourself. Um, that's absolutely vital. And I, uh, qu- quite clearly, we wouldn't be in the position we are today had I not met my co-founder um, or indeed the rest of my team. So let's go back to this piece on product market fit and sort of bringing your technology to, to market. What have been the biggest challenges that you've had in that, in that process so far? So one of the challenges of what we're doing is we're working a few steps ahead into the future. Mm. And we're building something which we know is going to be a significant necessary uh, component of that future. And and there are plenty of people that that also share that same belief, um, both in terms of academia and industry. They know this is something which is going to exist. Um, The challenge that we're faced is there is an uncertainty over the timelines. Um, So that's one thing that we've got to prepare for. And you've got to figure out what will it take to get you to this future, what you need to do um, uh, in order to get there. Um, So one of the things that we've been incredibly lucky is that we have found supporters in the form of investors who share this vision and have given us the confidence to remain solely focused on building out this 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 vision, and we've relied on you know proxies in the past to figure out you know are we working towards the right goal here, mm-hmm. uh, and those proxies might be um, you know interest from from other companies, seeing what are on the milestones of other companies' uh, timelines. We did actually start off working with clients, um, but as soon as we had that confidence um, that this was the right way to go. Um, we dropped everything and, and remained laser focused on building out the most core um, vital infrastructure that will be needed because unless we build that lower part of the stack, um, we essentially lose the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've had to remain laser focused on building out that lower part of the stack. Mm, and in terms of the process of getting people on board to make that vision a reality, yeah. um, I understand that you've been expanding the team recently. Mm-hmm. What have been some of the big lessons you've learned about hiring in the past few months? So it's tricky because when you when you are yourself and a co-founder, and you pull two extra people onto the team, you just doubled it, you know, and you need to be very careful to set in stone um, the right 
values, the right culture. And culture is one of these uh, ethereal terms which is thrown around and you know, you'd, you'd read about it in books. But until you start to see a team forming around you and copying your behaviors, it's, it's quite hard to actually visualize it. And you realize actually it's vital to get the right mixture, the right DNA in the company to begin with at the very beginning so that when it scales out, the same people who are your third and fourth hires are going to be the people who are, you know, leading the way for the 14th and 15th hires. Um, so, so that's been one thing which has been fun, um, but something which requires dedicated thought. Yeah, it was, that was going to be my next question. How do you go about being sort of explicit about culture in a way at the start so that it does become those implicit values that anybody who comes onto the team sort of can absorb? Like, And how much time or resource do you dedicate to doing that? Because obviously it doesn't have any immediate tangible returns. Yeah. Um, but as you said, it's clearly important in the long run. Yeah, I think um, we, we, there's, a, there's a phrase saying that the CEO has, CEO has three jobs. Um, the first is that you um, hire the very best people. Second is that you drill the vision into everybody in the team so they can make the decisions on, on those, um, those milestones, those criteria themselves, rather than having to continue going back to the, to the founders, for example. And the third is, 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 is never run out of money. And we've had to have a uh, you know, strategy for each of those, those three. Now, the vision component, um, we actually have computer vision um, meetings every single Monday morning. So it's a computer vision company, there's a very large computer vision team, and this is an, a, an excuse for them to sit around a, a sofa in the office and to write up on the whiteboard what is they've been doing in the last week, what milestones they've smashed, and what they need uh, in order to succeed for the milestones this week. And we realized actually, rather than just being a, a you know, a technical process of saying, what are these technical milestones? We should actually have a company vision meeting and do a similar kind of process where we take everybody through the milestones of the company, the ethos of the company, the strategy of the company, so everybody understands why we're making the decisions that we're making. Um, and, you know, we'd have those more formal uh, company vision meetings every two months or so. And in addition to that, I send these uh, email updates uh, that we refer to as our game on updates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's quite clear that any startup is in a race um, and we have these game on updates to update everybody on the team to understand how the different components of what they're doing fits in with the overall vision and to get people to rally around the, 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 the central goal so that when the you know, new additions come in, they can kind of pick up that with as, as least amount of, of air resistance as possible. Without naming names, have you made any hiring mistakes? And did you learn anything specific from those mistakes? Um, so thankfully, we haven't made any mistakes right now that have, have had any you know, detrimental impact. Um, but um, I would say that for us in our particular industry, it's not the same for every single industry, but majority holds true. Uh, your team is your most valuable asset. If you don't have a, you know, triple A team, then your chances of building a triple A product are diminished. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's where the fight has been for talent, particularly in the area that we're working in. You know, there are only a few uh, people with the experience or academic backgrounds that, that are able to fulfill the, the tasks that we need. And it's been a, a challenge to get those people, whether we're an early stage startup like us at Scape or whether you're Google, whether you're Apple, or whether you're Facebook, they're all fighting for the same pool of talent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one that up until this point, you know, we feel like we've been winning. Uh, but when you get to a certain stage, you realize you need to take that hands-on process and figure out how you scale that outwards. And our primary task right now is to, is to find essentially a, a head of talent that can take um, what our process is right now, turn it into something which can be scaled upwards and um, take off just a little bit of pressure from the founder's shoulders. Um, and perhaps um, we should have done that far earlier on. Um, although, it, like I said, it hasn't been a, a crippling factor to this point. Sure. It's interesting you mentioned that. It's something actually we um, discussed with Theo from CloudNCA in another interview, the sort of the importance of having somebody to focus on that. 
and how there are a lot of intangibles wrapped up in the recruitment process that you then also need to sort of replicate when you try and do it at scale. Yeah. Um, and that obviously, once you have the experience of trying to do it, yeah. you find out what it's really all about. Absolutely. So we've spoken a lot about your experiences learning through the business. What have you learned about yourself personally from the experience of building Scape and this sort of up and down entrepreneurial journey that you've been going through? Sure. So it's a, it's definitely a, um, a journey in terms of leadership. You know, when it's, again, when it's you and your co-founder sat around a desk, it's a very different atmosphere to you sat next to your co-founder in, you know, a room of 23 people. Um, and it's a challenge trying to figure out how to prepare for that. And, you know, that's one of the things that right now we feel like, you know, we've, we've made a huge amount of learnings in terms of, of how you structure that, how you ensure that, you know, you do even doing things like one-on-ones and, and, um, you know, team updates and how to, how to structure those in such a manner where you, you, you essentially get out of the way and let the team do what they need to do, um, when you're not needed. And then when you are, you're immediately there and you can offer support. That's something that I feel you can only learn through experience um, and being able to do that and be a sponge for anything that would be a distraction to my team is something that, that has been pretty powerful from a personal point of view. Do you feel a lot of the skills that successful entrepreneurs usually require can only be learned through experience, i.e. it's sort of a waste of time to be thinking about them in the abstract. You've just got to get out and do it. Yes, I do. I think um, solid foundations are always good. Um, so I'm not saying that the theory is not worthwhile looking into, mm. uh, but certainly um, theory has got nothing on, on reality. Mm. The map is not the territory. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Let's finish up with just one final question. So if you could go back to have a chat to yourself when you were about to start Scape, would you give yourself any particular piece of advice? Just keep running. It's a great note to end on. Ed, thank you so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much.